My name is Sasha Morris, I'm the Geo Educator for the Waitaki Whitestone Geopark. And I'm pretty excited that David Barrell has, um, is here this evening to speak with us. Um, David is a senior scientist with GNS, Geological and Nuclear Sciences. Um, and he, he is an engineering geologist and geomorphologist with over 25 years experience uh, working in this district. So wealth of knowledge. So I know I for one am going to be learning a lot this evening. His work includes research into climate change, active tectonics, geological hazards and groundwater resources. And of course, as Helen said, he contributed to the Geoparks UNESCO application uh, with focus on the general geological description. Uh, and just from personal uh, experience, David's at the end of the phone. David, what's this? <laughs> it's okay. I'll send you to a document or a paper. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so really excited to hear uh, your talk this evening uh, on Gondwana going forward. So um, at the end, we will have a time for questions and answers. Um, to do with David's talk, so hold your questions till then. And over to you, we look forward to learning more about the district. Great, thank you, Sasha, for your introduction. Thank you, Helen. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here with you this evening. Um, it's a yeah, it's, it's a very special part of uh, New Zealand to me, the uh, Waitaki Valley. I've done a lot of my um, a lot of formative work in my career has been done up, up the valley um, in relation to the uh, hydro dams um, and up in the headwaters I've worked a lot on the glacial history recorded in moraines there so uh, <coughs> yeah it's a very uh, special area to me and it's a great, uh, a great privilege to be here and share some of the uh, exciting aspects or at least one aspect of the exciting history here which is the imprint of Gondwana which, which is a supercontinent which um, still has a strong imprint in uh, the rocks of this area. Now, <clears throat> a lot of work has been done over um, recent years um, on the nature of the offshore around the islands of New Zealand and um, it's been shown through collection of uh, rock samples from dredges and from trawling <coughs> that Although the islands of New Zealand are quite small, we're surrounded by a large area of continental rocks which are submerged um, beneath one or two kilometres of water. And in fact, the area of the, the continent, the continental rocks, <coughs> is this grey area here. It's about a third the size of Australia, <coughs> so it's not trivial. Um, and, and so uh, it's um, been very much put on the map by uh, recent work, including my uh, colleague and Nathan Mick Mortimer, who's uh, championed and promoted the, um, the idea of this new continent. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's been a very busy few years as this, this uh, knowledge of the submerged continent has been uh, put forward, published in international um, journals. Um, so, <clears throat> This may be familiar to some of you, so bear with me. I'm just going to go, a, go through, through, through a few basics of um, uh, the process of the Earth's crust. Um, <clears throat> so we have two basic types of rock on the Earth's surface. We have what we call ocean crust, oceanic crust, which is uh, what underlies the ocean basins all around the world. Um, it's volcanic, it's, it's basaltic volcanic, so it's, it's of a certain chemistry. And it's formed um, by the mood. <clears throat> There's a convection within the, um, the mantle of the Earth, and, and that, that convection is a bit like very slow boiling pot. And so um, that moves and it drags the cold surface with it. So when it's in places where it is, is surging up and, and boiling away, um, we have new oceanic crust formed and that's pushed away, and at the margins of the ocean basins, it is recycled back down under the continental rocks, which themselves have had their origin in ocean crust over billions of, billions of years of Earth history, with um, the uh, rocks going down <coughs> underneath, um, underneath the continent, I'll just point it up here easier, going down there, 
materials scraped off and built up in there, and over time that material has been accreted and built into these um, continental rock masses. Um, I think of them sometimes as the scum of the earth. So they're, they're the stuff that sort of boiled up, has been scraped off and is floating around there. So we have two main processes. We have the what's called seafloor spreading, where the new, new, new ocean, ocean crust is formed, and we have subduction, which is where the ocean crust is pushing down under the continental margins. Um, this is a <clears throat> this cartoon here illustrates some of the key features that we um, that we have at subduction margins, um, and so we have in here um, the ocean crust going down under the continent. Uh, we'll often have an ocean trench, an area of deep water along the uh, along where the uh, ocean crust is going down, and we have what's called an accretionary prism. It's all the sediments being scraped off and, and piled up as, as the ocean, ocean crust goes down. And that builds up the continental crust. As that ocean crust goes down under the continent, it starts to melt. And it's, it's also quite wet rock. And so that creates melting and magma's formed and makes its way to the surface. And that's why around the um, the margin of the Pacific Ocean, which has got subduction margins around all of, almost all of it, you have volcanoes, <coughs> because those volcanoes are formed by that ocean crust going down, melting, and then <coughs> the magma coming up and get light. So that's the origin of the Ring of Fire. Um, <coughs> it's only been 50 odd years since this theory has really fully evolved, and, and um, it's has passed every test of the hypothesis that people have put at it, so it, it still continues to explain things um, extremely well, and it's uh, really standing the test of time. And this uh, Pokari White Island is um, an example of a volcano formed part of the Ring of Fire, and it's forming over top of where the ocean crust has been pushed down under the North Island. So the, the Pacific Ocean floor going down on the North Island, melting, and we get volcanoes like Kaukari, uh, Ruapehu, Tongariro. Um, another cartoon, though just a bit more, <coughs> a bit more of the detail, and, and this starts to become <coughs> important for the next part of our story, because the rocks that I'm going to talk about um, in the Waitaki district, and, the, and these are the fundamental um, geological foundations, the grey lake and the schist, originally formed in this environment here, sediments being scraped off as the Pacific Ocean floor went down under Gondwana land. Um, so <clears throat> we'll come back to some of that. And people often look at a diagram like that and say, how do you know? <clears throat> and so one of the main, you know, how do you know all that's going on? It's way down out of sight, we don't really know. And so one of the key pieces of evidence that was used to build this theory um, is the explanation of earthquake. This is, a, this is a profile from east to west under the North Island. <clears throat> and those little dots and circles are the locations of earthquake, earth, <clears throat> earthquakes under the ground. And so from the Wairarapa through to uh, parts of Wellington, there's a whole lot of shallow earthquakes and there in the continental crust, and there's a whole belt of deep earthquakes that go down to, well, underneath, un, un, underneath the parts of Wellington, the uh, no, 200 meter deep. And that's the ocean crust going down. <coughs> and so, um, so we, 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 we have the top 30 kilometers or so is where the continental crust earthquakes occur, and then we have the subduction zone earthquakes going down um, like so. So that's, that's how we, we come to know um, the detail of, of, of the subduction process. So this is a map of um, <clears throat> the current situation of, of, of um, the continents. We have the Zealandia continent here in green, um, Australia, Antarctica, South America, um, and these jagged blue lines 
are the mid-ocean ridges. That's where the uh, convection is pulling the crust apart and new ocean crust is forming along those uh, blue lines. And you can see, uh, we'll, we'll see some of these in detail, and you can see how well expressed they are um, in the sea floor. So we come to Gondwana. Um, it, it's been called a supercontinent. It's very, you know, it was uh, it comprised um, all of the continents of the southern hemisphere were all joined together at one time, um, and, and it was also had a connection through to the um, the northern continent of Asia and to Europe and North America. Um, so this was the setting, this, this was the situation about 200 million years ago. All of the southern continents were joined together and Australia and Antarctica, I mean they're, they're, they're large old continental blocks, very old rocks. But here was where Zealandia was going to form on the margin of um, Gondwana, the Pacific Basin Ocean Floor wasn't, wasn't the Pacific then because the continents weren't the arrangement that they have today. But um, what was the equivalent of the Pacific was pushing down underneath Gondwana, so pushing down that way, and sediments which were draining, rivers were draining off Australia um, and Antarctica onto the sea floor, and then they were being scraped off as it went down. So <clears throat> We, we, 200 million years ago, New Zealand was at the margin of a big ocean, being in, in, in our geological foundations were being formed from sediments being scraped off and turned into rock at the ocean, <coughs> ocean basin margin. Um, same sort of deal, and, and here, this odd looking outline through here is roughly where the coast of parts of New Zealand would have been at that time. So you can see the eastern um, side of the... Mm. Yeah, so that's the uh, west coast of the South Island, west of North Island, east coast of the South Island. So that was the arrangement of where our, our coastlines today would have been at that time. But at that time it was um, coastal mountain range with all the sediments being scraped off piled up sort of being bulldozed off the ocean floor and up against the side of uh, Gondwana. So that's the um, <clears throat> that's the arrangement. There was a hinterland of older rocks through here which we still see today in the west coast Nelson and in uh, Fjord and Stewart Island. This belt of blue through here uh, the rocks that we see here in the Waitaki district and in fact the whole eastern South Island. Um, so the, the, the blue was where the belt of grey wacky rocks were being formed from crumpled up sediments and there was a belt where the crumpling up was so much that it pushed them down, put the, that the rocks pushed down deep enough to metamorphose them into schist. So the, uh, the schist of central Otago is just the grey wacky rocks cropped up, it's been heated and pressurised, and, and so the chemistry is identical. You have a, have a piece of schist and you have a piece of grey wacky. If you analyse the chemistry, they're the same, but they look very different. Now, they're probably a good time to <coughs> share with you some actual rocks, <coughs> pass them around. Yeah. So we actually will give that a while. Yeah, I went through on those. A little bit of bracing. Um, so amongst those you'll see some grey wacky, which is sort of smooth equal grey, and there are a few bits of semi just that have got some, some, some layering and, and some uh, fine uh, preferred orientation. <laughs> so feel free to pass them around, it's just, um, just remember what you're holding there is um, a 200 million year old piece of Gondwana. <coughs> Even if it was explained off the road, off the roadside. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> so things changed about 85 million years ago. There was a, um, a, a change in the way the Earth's crust, crustal plates, the, the plates were moving, and 
Don Dwyer started to split up. <coughs> and what happened in the location of, or to the east of what was to become Zealandia, the Tasman Sea opened by sea force spreading. And that's. Um, <coughs> Ah, uh, yeah, so that's the Tasman Sea opening up through there. This is the Southern Ocean starting to open up, separating Zealandia from Antarctica. Uh, was it, uh, believe it or not, I mean, <coughs> those who've been to Australia know that it's about a three hour flight, <coughs> um, which is, you know, quite a ways. That Tasman Sea opened and was between 85 and 52 million years ago, so it only took. Um, What's that? 33 million years for that whole Tasman Sea to open, <coughs> which is um, it was about the speed of fingernail growth or hair growth. <coughs> that, was, that was how fast it was, and if you let that happen for 33 million years, you end up with quite a long plane trip or a bumpy, <laughs> or a bumpy boat ride. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the story of how Zealandia came into being by splitting off from the edge of Gondwana, and when we've, we've those rocks that you've got there are pieces of that older history. <clears throat> um, as Zealandia was split off, the Tasman Sea and Southern Ocean opened up and Zealandia was pushed out into the Pacific Basin. Um, a change happened about 25 million years ago and a new boundary between the continental blocks opened up through New Zealand. Um, this was to become the Alpine Fault. <clears throat> And we have a couple of distinctive rock belts there. There's a, there's a belt of rocks here, which we get inland from inland Canterbury through up into eastern North Island, <coughs> and another belt down here in um, Otago Southland. They're all the same sort of rocks. I mean, they're a distinctive belt of rocks, and they're our key marker for what has happened <coughs> to uh, the land here. And this. Was to be, this is to become the Alpine Fault, and this is the new subduction zone with the ocean for the Pacific going down under the North Island so 25 million years ago. Um, by about 10 million years ago, there's, <coughs> we're starting to see some familiarity with the outline. These uh, rock belts have been offset along the Alpine Fault and um, starting to become familiar through to today. Um, other fault lines have formed and, and further fragmented these uh, distinctive red and green rock belts. So this is where we've got to. Another five million years of, of what's happening currently will give us a different shape in New Zealand. <coughs> this will become very skinny and this will rotate out more. So it will not look at <coughs> five million years from now, it's not going to look at all familiar to uh, whoever may be there to look at it. <laughs> So, <clears throat> this is a, the main colours are the topography on land and the bathymetry beneath the sea. So, uh, these deeper blues are deeper than five kilometres below sea level. The uh, yellows are maybe down to a kilometre deep, and the greens are um, above sea level. So, we have these some distinctive rock belts that we'll have a look at here. There's a belt of rocks with a medium bacillus through um, southern South Island and again up in Nelson and heading off towards the north. Um, and this belt of schist, the harsh schist it's called, metamorphosed grey wacky, which comes on land through Otago. And we see it again up in Nelson, Marlborough and um, in places in the um, Kaimanama Range in North Island. It's also been found in oil drill holes. So this is also these uh, <coughs> these uh, white dots or squares are actually data points on how this map is made. So I'll this is quite a complex diagram, but this sort of sets out the scene for New Zealand's uh, rock types. Um, we have these blue and orange and green rocks, that's the what we call the basement rock, that's the undermass. Um, they're given the name of Austral Super Province. Um, and those are the rocks from Gondwana. They were formed at the margin of Gondwana 
they haven't formed in New Zealand setting out of the Pacific Ocean at all. They, they come from the margin of a big continent, and so those are the Gondwana rocks. And after we split away, Zealandia subsided, the sea came in, and we had what's called the Zealandian mega sequence on those colours there, forming a cover on the older rocks. Um, and then with the, the uh, pinks of the various volcanic rocks. So <clears throat> the grey wackies are here and here, some other volcanic rocks through there. So Waitaki district's in about there on this diagram. So we've got grey wacky rocks starting to go towards schist as you go to the uh, southwest. Now, my colleagues have made these uh, <coughs> two beautiful maps. Um, they're published as posters, and also you can view them online at GNS site. You can actually, um, if you Google GNS site, explore Zealandia, you'll find your way to, the, to these maps. You can turn bits off and turn them on and drive around in it. It's uh, really fun. This map here is just the topography and bathymetry. So this is elevation relation to sea level. The blues are ocean basins, shallower seas with continental rocks and yellows, and actual lands and the uh, browns. This here is a geological interpretation. This is a this is a bathymetric and topographic map. This is a geological map <coughs> of the same area, showing the. Do you have a mouse that worked, but does not work now, so I'll just keep waving my arms. Um, this is the belt of um, grey wackies and schist through here, comes into the Alpine Fault, offset hundreds of kilometres that way, and then carries on through towards New Caledonia. <coughs> this is the belt of um, igneous rocks, this is granites, um, and similar rocks which we have in Fiordland. Stewart Island, and up again in Westland and Buller, and Nelson. Um, so those are the, those, this was the green line on the earlier map, and here was that uh, pink line that we had. <coughs> so these things up here are what we call volcanic arcs, um, and we have the continental massif of Australia over there. Just a bit more detail, this is um, <coughs> a bit more of a close-up. Just to get an idea of what this area of the, of, of the Zealandia continental platform looks like compared to an ocean basin. Um, that's a, that, that's a, an exaggerated model of what that elevation looks like. So this is the um, <coughs> Zealandia continental platform and then deep ocean basins around here, and you can see the Macquarie Ridge, which is um, the continuation of the Alpine Fault offshore. So it, it certainly highlights that New Zealandia does stand proud above the uh, ocean basin. And just another view, this is, <coughs> this is some of the view that you will get if you go to our interactive web map. The blues out here are the ocean floor, and over here, and these um, dotted lines are different ages of rock. And so this is the um, axis of the Tasman spreading centre, this heavy blue line, <coughs> and then there's a 10 million year old band of time. So look, that's about 10 million years of spreading. Um, and the same out in the ocean basin there. And yes, just another view of, of highlighting the Zealandia platform versus the deep ocean. It's, um, around us, that's just bathymetry, and that's the uh, geological map that goes with it. I think one of the most amazing things for me about planet Earth is that <coughs> on land we can sort of see these mountains and valleys and basins, they're all plain to see. But all we can't see is the ocean floor. And when you have a detailed map of its elevation, you can see all these features out 
in the ocean floor looks for all the world like a river. <clears throat> and in fact, that it effectively it is a river, it's just an underwater river. Um, it's formed by sediment washing off the edge of the continental shelf, which you can see is this very sharp line here. Um, it falls off and forms sort of density flows, which go down the ocean floor, and they scour channels, and they have meanders, and all sorts of things. So it's, um, this has never seen the air. This is all entirely under the sea. And we have, I think, the other ones up in, uh, mm -hmm. off the west coast. They're um, fascinating things. And you can see details of little volcanic mounds on the ocean floor. There's the seamounts. Um, so here, yeah, and then you can see all sorts of crazy things, probably fault lines of various sorts down off the uh, southwestern South Island. It's, uh, I think, um, for me, it's been one of the most revealing things of modern science is actually getting looks at what's beneath the sea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it just, and it's all laid out there if you've got the right <coughs> means to scan it. Well, move on past that. So, um, that's, the, that's the broader picture of the geological setting that um, is so well expressed in the uh, Waitaki district. Um, and we're focused more on how it's got to be where it is and, and looked at the, the foundation, the basement rock that underlies us. Um, this is um, Waitaki district, this is just a topographic map. And we can put some geology on that. Um, all of the basement rocks are in these greyish colours, so forming the mountains. Um, all of the younger rocks, there's a landing mega sequence, are in these oranges, greens, and yellow. So you can see that <coughs> throughout the Waitaki area, there's an awful lot of those older basement rocks, and they're straight from Gondwana. They, 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 they uh, didn't form here, they've, um, they've, they've come into being. Um, in a different place. It's a bit of a cheat, this isn't actually in the Waitaki district, this is the uh, Malta Brun range up uh, near Araki Mount Cook. Um, and you can see some of the character of these um, these rocks. So most of the, the Grey Wicky rocks, which we call part of the tallest supergroup, named after uh, mountain range and inland Canterbury, are sandstones and mudstones. And you can see here that they've actually, they were laid flat originally, they've now been tilted up right on end. And you can see there's a, a dark mudstone layer, lighter coloured sandstones. And so there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of these different layers through there. You know, that's all geological time in there. And, and we're probably looking at um, hundreds and hundreds of metres of sediments that were laid down on the ocean floor off the edge of Gondwana land and scraped off <coughs> um, a couple of hundred million years ago. It's um, <coughs> always quite uh, <coughs> breathtaking to me just to sort of know that we have all of that deep history um, just laid out in our backyards. Ah, this is the lake, this is the river town of the spillway um, on the Ohio River, and if you peer over the edge of the spillway, you can see all the same deal. And, of steeply tilted layer of sandstones and mudstones and the grey wacky and you can even go to the car park beside the spillway and um, <coughs> see these uh, chunky chunky blocky sandstones and then these very uh, fragile flaky mudstones of a sandstone layer. Um, there are ways of working out which <coughs> Which, which direction was laid down first. In fact, these, these uh, sediments have been tilted up past, past vertical. So actually, they're actually, the rocks are getting younger that way, even though they've <coughs> turned right over. Um, that was nice and simple. This is the uh, Benmore Dam spillway. Mm -hmm. And even to, even to an interested geologist, this is a, this is a horrible mess of rocks. It's all shot full of Faults broken up and it's um, spectacular, but it's um, yeah, it's, it's had a, it's had a lot of deformation through it, and that deformation probably is from Gondwana too. That was probably deformation that happened 
while all of those rocks were being plastered up against the side of Pondwana land. <coughs> and so, um, even though the features are preserved today, it's not recent. Um, here's an example of a sandstone layer, a mudstone layer, and it's a fault between the two that has shifted those two rocks into um, a side by side arrangement. We then go, uh, as we go towards the west, we get into rocks which are more, in, which have are, which are, which are be <coughs> become metamorphosed for low grade schist. And so this layering here is actually the, the layering in the, in, in the fine grained schist. And uh, one or two of the rocks that are going around are rocks of that sort. <coughs> um, this is a view into the McRae's gold mine, a bit from about three years ago. Um, and that's formed in a much higher grade schist, and so <clears throat> you can see that the grey wacky rock has been heated up and pressurised so much that it's all um, separated out into layers of quartz versus darker layers of other minerals. The chemistry of that's identical to a piece of grey wacky, that, that if you measure it up it's no different at all, it's just that this has been cooked, the other stuff hasn't. So, so <clears throat> I, I, I guess the thing to highlight is that um, even though the geological foundations that underlie us here are going to go down to the, the vast depths um, of grey wacky and schists of Gondwana origin, they're by no means dead geologically because they're being eroded and brought into the new world. <clears throat> and so the Erosion of um, uh, mountains and hinterland is making its way into rivers, so you have stones as well as, <coughs> and, and as they go downstream, they get worn away, and so that you get <coughs> bits rubbed off that become sand, silt. So all the sediment that coming is coming down the uh, Waitaki River, for example, um, is aside from a few bits of limestone and so forth, it's mostly from the hinterland, and it's mostly Gondwana being recycled into new. Um, <coughs> into new deposits, and, and that's um, uh, what you see when you see these <coughs> pieces of Gondwana in the beach here and over there, but also they have been laid down in great thickness in the, in the Waitaki Plains, and so this is a thickness of uh, gravel that was laid down by the Waitaki River <coughs> probably several tens of thousands of years ago. Um, and in fact, <coughs> down under the northern end of Omaru, if you walk along the sea cliff, you can see the boundary between the river gravels of the Waitaki, and then there's a thick cover of windblown silt, which is named by the name of Lewis, over the top of it. We have done some dating there, and the base of that Lewis is about 60,000 years old. So the gravels are <coughs> beneath that are, are older, but it's just an example of this was sort of recycling from tens of thousands of years ago, being made into new deposits. This is a living deposit and an active beach. And of course, once you get the word out to people, then they start to um, celebrate it. So, uh, um, from the work we've done dating the base of history up in the uh, Mackenzie Basin, we've stayed at Lake Ruatan for holiday park quite a lot, and uh, I've promoted some of the history there and so uh, uh, Tony who runs the uh, <coughs> Park has um, got, a, uh, got a plaque commissioned for his rock just explaining that it's um, bringing a bit of history <coughs> and, and it's, um, it's a piece of gondwana which is still part of our living world today. So I um, guess to summarise um, New Zealand's geological origins and those of the uh, Geopark um, go back a long time, two million years ago, um, and we have pieces which are direct from Gondwana, and, and they, um, you know, they've, they've come from a different place, and that's why you look at those gravity rocks and go, where did they fall? Well, they formed somewhere way, way, way over there, and a way, way back in time. Um, and you know, those rocks, even though they're an ancient foundation, are still being recycled into the modern world, um, into recent deposits and future deposits. 
Um, and I, I think that I just to end on the point that that marks a fundamental geological distinction for the rocks of the Waitaki district and of course the whole eastern South Island. You have the, the older basement rocks that come from a deep part in Gondwana and then we have the younger rocks which have been formed in New Zealand as we see it today. That includes the quartz sandstones and uh, the limestones, the volcanic <coughs> stones here are all part of true Zealandian, um, true Zealandian geology. They're formed here, I mean they're, they're, they're indigenous if you like, as opposed to the um, imported foundations. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a fantastic talk. And I wonder who will ever look at a piece of grey wacky or show it again in the same way. So, next time you are uh, driving up the Waitaki and go through those uh, road cuttings with just exposed. You've got to think this man. <laughs> and uh, how that's just this formed. And the same with Grey Wacky, those wonderful rocks that we find in our rivers. Um, so, amazing history there. And uh, just laid out so in a way that's so accessible for us to learn. So, thank you very much for that. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, just wonder if anybody has any questions on, on this particular talk that uh, they'd like to put to David at all. So, I'm not a geologist, my question will probably show that. So what you're saying then is, is that the base rock that is Zealandia, it is not part of the Australian continent, it was created by that subduction process. Yep. And so it's being created in Gondwana land, but it's a unique creation as distinct from what's Australian. I'm an Aussie, by the way, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, so, so, so Aussies keep the ears wiki now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, the deal, yeah. yes. A, a thing which has been um, a long-standing puzzle for geologists is where did the sediment come from that made the Grey Lake just because there's heaps of it. I mean, the, those rocks go from here up to eastern North Island. There's a huge amount of material went in to make those rocks. Where did it come from? And that's been a been an active discussion amongst geologists for decades. Um, one of my colleagues, Chris Adams, has specialised in looking at me measuring the chemistry of rocks. And so what we know for sure is that they're not the same, they could not have come from the rocks of the west coast or Nelson. There are, there are older rocks there, but the chemistry is wrong. They, they can't have come from there, they've come from somewhere else. Uh, some people have thought that Mari Birdland and coastal Antarctica has got the sort of rocks that could do it. Um, but the best match that my colleague Chris has found is with northern Queensland. So most likely, if, if the source rocks still exist, probably northern Queensland was where the sediment came from that made our rocks. So we do have an Australian connection in there. Crowwick <laughs> <laughs> so, is Australian scum. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing is uh, that that sort of undersea river uh, with its delta that we saw, is, it's amazing. But does that sort of link back to the fact that we're suffering, suffering severe erosion in this part on our coastline? And a similar thing's probably happening underneath. Um, That's got an erosion type factor, because it's right alongside it. Yeah, so... Um this will be a topic for another talk, but, 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 but one, one of the things which also goes into seeing the bathymetry of, of, of margins of, of Zealandia is that the sea level is level but not constant. And so, so over time, particularly during glacial cycles, so times of ice age, times of cold, ice formed on northern hemisphere continents, the sea went down because so much ice was on land. And the difference between now, which is minimum ice globally, and that's like like our climate of the last 10,000 years, nothing to do with what, what is currently happening with, with the more rapid warming, to a full glaciation is about 125 metres of sea level. So that 20,000 years ago, the sea, which we're used to being out there, was actually about 40 kilometres off the, off, off 
off the current shore at the end of the continental shelf. Um, and it was at times of that low sea level when, when, when the, the continental shelf was exposed and the sea was actually at the edge of the continental slope, that's when stuff would have been washing in down those canyons. At the moment it can't really get there because the rivers bring it to the sea or the coast's eroding and it just gets swept along. Um, along the coast, so it's kept near shore. You need to have the low sea level in order to get those canyons working properly. And they certainly would have worked because all the rivers would have drained just to the edge of very deep water. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so, so a lot of that is, is probably largely fossil features which date from uh, the peaks of, of, of ice age cycles, of which there's been about 20 in the last two million years. So, so yeah, there's 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 a there's a whole other story behind those canyons. <laughs> I think you're no, 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 sorry, you're you're looking at that. Carry on. One of our um, colleagues in the uh, founder of the GFI, Patrick McKeever, an Irishman, he was a little sceptical about sea land here when we put in our submission. Has he gradually been converted? Do you know? I, 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 I don't know. Because he was sort of north and saying, well, we, don't, we haven't heard anything about that, you know, at the time. You know, it would be interesting to know whether the word is spreading. Well, I had a similar question, actually. What interest is there globally around the land here in this, this new world? Well, we're very proud of it. <laughs> um, uh, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think it's one of those... Um, features of general interest because it's, 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 a, it's a big chunk of continent, you know, it's, it's, it's um, you know, a third the size of Australia, which is quite a big continent, so it, it's, um, I'd say something worth knowing about, and I, I think uh, there had been a bit of debate about 15 years ago when the idea was being tossed around, mm. because um, some Australian folks were thinking, well, we're, we should call it Tasmantis. <laughs> <laughs> so that, yeah, that, didn't, that, that didn't, didn't quite deal with the local folks. So the land there went out in the end. So I mean, when you look at it, this whole Zealandia thing is, is sort of a living geology compared to Australia. It's been dead very long ago. Mm, yep. Hasn't well, changed that much, has it? No, no much more right. active. There, there, there's a lot to be said for being small enough that you've got a, a, a a wet maritime climate because that brings you rain, it brings you erosion, um, and plus we've got a very active geological boundary through us. So those two factors, um, you know, bring bring what happens here up an order of magnitude or more compared to the hinterland of a big continent. Is the land here uh, recognised by um, scientists in the northern hemisphere? Is it now recognised? It's, it's hard to say because um, you know, the process with these things is that the idea is put forward, it's, public, it's, it's published in a scientific, yeah. um, uh, in a, as a scientific article, and then you wait and see how much people use it. Some, some, some things that are proposed sort of fall into disuse and get forgotten about. Um, something like Zelandia, I think, is something which is more likely than not to be picked up by people because it's straightforward and I mean, you can, you, can, you can see it on the map of the sea floor. Yeah. If I may, I'd like to take you off a piece of the weed, but to take you out of the Waitaki. When I was doing my degree in physical geography, part of the things that we studied was the dynamic nature of the Hikarangi Trough. Yeah. And we were told about the nature, of course, of the interconnect between the Hikarangi Trough through to the Alpine Fault being the three main faults of the Wide Owl, Hope, and I don't think it is. And it was about the same time that the Christchurch event happened. And I actually asked a question to my uh, lecture at the time. Could the Darfield fault be a possible, because I should really clarify, obviously everything being stopped by the Chatham rise. That's where it didn't cause any of the subduction to travel further. And when the Darfield events happened, I actually asked my lecturer at the time if that could possibly be a new interconnect opening up. And she thought, that's an interesting Question. So, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I, 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 I guess I have to preface it by saying that I've had to unlearn a whole lot of what I thought I knew, thanks to those earthquakes. That, that when the mm -hmm. Darfield earthquake came along, and then the Christchurch earthquakes on, um, in fact, three years before we published the geological map of the Christchurch area, and I had spent um, 
weeks driving around all the roads on the Canterbury Plains looking for fault line scarps, which, you know, which, which when you get your eye on them, you can see them. And there sure wasn't one there. I mean, I, I drove the road without it, without a pier, and, and, and there was nothing there at the time. And so um, we've subsequently learned that that fault moves once every 20,000 to 30,000 years. So it's, it's a fault that moves very infrequently. We, we've, we've managed to dig up and date a, a previous movement on it. And um, it's a very inactive fault. But it just so happened, just by sheer, by sheer chance, um, it was due to go not long after Europeans settled um, in uh, Aotearoa. And um, it's just, so, so I think it's, the problem is knowing how many other faults, and there are many faults like that, which we see no recent activity on, but that might just be because they go so infrequently and they just haven't done it mm -hmm. recently. So geologically, I, I think the, um, the transition from the subduction of the ocean floor under the North Island does have quite a, a general transition to the fault lines of Marlborough that goes through and join the Alpine Fault. The whole system, has got to be evolving over time because as the shape of New Zealand changes, orientation of things change, and so it's evolving. We don't know what the rate of evolution really are. So I, I think um, a lot of that science and, and, and our understanding of details of that, um, we're still only scratching the surface. I mean, the Kaikoura earthquake was, um, some of my colleagues have sort of had ideas that maybe a couple of faults might move at the same time, but nobody, Nobody even contemplated the earthquake starting down near Calverton and then breaking through about 20 faults all the way up into Melbourne and wipe that out in the space of um, in the space of a minute or two. Um, you know, it's uh, that really wasn't on the radar, and, and I, I think um, yeah, I, I've had to unlearn a lot of stuff. But I thought I, I thought I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, yeah, okay, no, maybe I didn't know that after all. So. Um, I, I think that for me that's been um, one of the most noteworthy things of the, of the, of the, of the whole um, of the whole sequence of events in the last ten years is that um, you know what we thought was quite simple actually may be complicated as more the exception than the rule. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, it was. Um, it was. It was quite interesting because on the day it happened, so New Zealand seismologists leapt into action, and, and one of the cleverest things about earthquake seismology is that you've got seismographs which are the reporting scattered around the place, and the way that the earthquake waves arrive tell you how the fault moves. And so, if, essentially, if the first wave of the earthquake, think of the earthquake waves are like that. If the first wave meets you with a trough rather than a crest, that tells you something about the movement on the fault. And so from where the troughs and crests arrive in different places of the seismographs, you can work out whether the movement was up and down or sideways. And you can make an estimate as to whether the fault was that, that way or that way. It's, it's um, a very clever thing that comes from seismology and has been known for a hundred years probably, which you can work these things out. Um, and so <clears throat> the New Zealanders, the New Zealand seismologists, um, looked at the seismograph results and said, okay, it was an up-down bolt movement because that was what the seism that was that was what they recorded. The US Geological Survey, who measured the earthquake after it had gone through the Earth, because a big earthquake like that goes right through the earth, but you, you measure on the other side as well. And they said, no, no, it's sideways, mm. because that was what they measured. Um, so, in fact, what New Zealand recorded was, was the first movement on one of those fault planes, which was that. So the, the whole thing was kicked off by a movement like that, and then that triggered the sideways one. Mm. And so by the time it got to the US, through the earth, the, the sideways one had caught up and overtaken the first one. And so they, they measured the second movement, we measured the first one here. So, uh, here, more unlearning had to be done. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Are there any other um, 
probably take one last question on the um, talk that's been given this evening. No? Well, David, this is going to be good thing. Oh, yeah. good. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's going to be good again just to thank you. This is full of local treats. Lovely. So just to say thank you very much for um, coming and sharing your expertise with us. Um, and if we just want to give David a round of applause. Um, now just to note, I have uh, just a couple of um, announcements.